the January meeting. I mean, it's always such a pleasure to gather together in person with a lot of us, most of us here. Hopefully, we've braved the trains. It's really great to be back uh, after the pandemic, the, the closures that we've had. And it's a great pleasure tonight to introduce our 29th EPS Prize lecturer, Dr. Catherine Manning. Kathy completed her PhD in 2014 at the Center for Research in Autism and, e and Education, or CREA, at the Institute of Education in London. Her doctoral work investigated visual motion processing in typically developing and autistic children, and this led to a large number of very high quality publications. And since then, Kathy has secured highly competitive and independent funding, including a Sir Henry Welcome Independent Fellowship looking at visual processing and typical and atypical development. Kathy's work has combined multiple methods and introduced rigorous new paradigms into autism research, allowing her to challenge popular theories and offer new explanations of perceptual performance in autism. The quality of Kathy's work has been recognized through a series of prizes, including the International Society for Autism Research Distinguished Dissertation Award, and the APS Rising Star Award. Kathy's been very active in public en engagement and wider research leadership, particularly in open science. And in both of these domains, her, the impact of her work has been recognized through prizes and external funding. For example, through the award of a Wellcome Trust Enriching Engagement Project, looking at how public places can be challenging sensory environments for autistic people. Now, for those of you um, who are new to the EPS, who are visiting as guests, I just want to say that the EPS Prize is an award that we give to a highly accomplished young scholar within six years of the award of their PhD at the time of nomination. And really, in this context, looking at Kathy's CV, the quality and breadth of her contributions is just stunning. And I'm sure that Kathy will consider the award of the EPS Prize as a great personal achievement but it's also a testament to the quality and breadth of British experimental psychology to have such accomplished early career researchers leading research in our domain. So we're really delighted to have you here. Kathy is our EPS Prize Lecturer, and we're really looking forward to what you have in store for us tonight. Oh my gosh, no pressure. Then, um, <laughs> Thanks so much to the EPS for um, having me. It is really um, such an honour and I am so excited to be at an actual in-person EPS meeting again. So not even maternity leave or train strikes could get in my way. Um, and I just wanted to say, I, I mean I'm feeling quite overwhelmed right now, but um, thank you so much Lou for um, organising such a fantastic symposium just now and all of the wonderful speakers. It's just been um, really, really amazing. So thank you so much for your um, time, your presentations. So I'm gonna talk about, um, so I'm now at the University of Reading, but I'm gonna talk about mostly work that I did um, at the University of Oxford on a Wellcome Fellowship. Um, but even before then, when I was doing my PhD, just around the corner at Cray um, uh, UCL. So it's really nice to be back here as well on that kind of um, personal level. So we'll start with autism, um, as that's where I started with my research during my PhD. So autism is a developmental condition affecting social communication and interaction, but it also affects non-social domains. Um, and this includes differences in sensory processing. Um, and these sensory symptoms are now recognized as part of the diagnostic criteria, with the vast majority of autistic people um, having uh, differences in sensory processing um, of some kind. And sensory symptoms are found for all sensory modalities, but a few examples from vision are that autistic people um, may be overly sensitive to fluorescent or flickering lights, um, or perhaps autistic people may seek out visual stimulation, so maybe enjoying watching moving objects like fans or um, perhaps flickering fingers in front of eyes. And while sensory input can be enjoyable for autistic people, overreactivity to sensory information can be really overwhelming and even painful for autistic people. And so a better understanding of um, sensory processing is one of the top research priorities for the autism community. And linked to this, there's been a lot of research suggesting that 
visual perception is different in autistic people um, compared to non-autistic people, with differences in things like face processing, texture perception, um, orientation, and motion. So motion processing is one area that has been studied extensively. So this is a motion coherence task, where you have a proportion of dots that are moving together in the same direction. So example here is that the sun goes downwards, and then the remainder of the dots are moving in, in random directions. And a threshold is taken as the minimum proportion of dots that need to be moving in the same direction in order for the overall motion to be seen. And it has been found that autistic people generally need more dots to be moving in the same direction in order to see the overall motion. Um, compared to typically developing a service. And one of the most common explanations for this is that autistic participants tend to focus on details, um, like the individual dot motions, and then they struggle to combine the individual dot motions together in line with the weak central coherence account of autism. But it is not clear whether performance in motion <coughs> coherence tasks actually tells us anything specific about autism or whether it reflects a more general marker of atypical brain development, as might be expected by accounts such as dorsal stream vulnerability, which proposes that the brain systems involved in motion processing are particularly vulnerable to atypical development and therefore are affected in a range of different developmental conditions. And um, we've been talking about this in the symposium, but this question about condition specificity is important to our understanding of shared etiologies across conditions, as well as whether we might expect um, atypical visual processing to have a causal role in the development of um, developmental conditions. If visual processing is affected in the same way in all conditions, then maybe a causal account is unlikely. And it's definitely the case that um, motion coherence thresholds have been reported to be higher in a range of other developmental conditions besides autism. So dyslexia, fragile X, and Williams syndrome, for example. But it could be that motion coherence thresholds are elevated in these conditions for a range of different reasons. Currently, um, few studies actually make direct comparisons across conditions using the same um, tasks. There are some exceptions. And additionally, the tasks that are used may not be sensitive enough to actually differentiate between different developmental conditions. So the condition that I chose to focus on um, alongside autism was developmental dyslexia. So this is a developmental condition um, characterized by difficulties in learning to read, but dyslexia also affects visual processing. So um, one example of this is that um, people with dyslexia tend to have higher motion coherence thresholds than those without dyslexia. While in autism, the prevailing account um, for elevated motion coherence thresholds has been uh, weak central coherence, the most common account in dyslexia is the magnocellular hypothesis. So this suggests that the magnocellular visual pathway which is specialized for motion and then feeds on to the related um, dorsal stream, that this pathway functions differently in dyslexia. And interestingly, there are some who think that this magnocellular functioning is causal to the development of dyslexia, but this is um, fiercely debated, so it's, it's quite an interesting area. So what am I going to do? I wanna talk about two sets of studies that have aimed to apply more sensitive methods and computational models to try and uncover the parameters involved in visual processing tasks and applying those um, methods to both autistic and dyslexic populations to identify areas of convergence and or divergence. The first approach is an equivalent noise approach which aims to uncover the spatial limits to visual processing and then the second approach aims to uncover the temporal dynamics involved by using a combination of EEG and diffusion modeling. Okay, so let's start with the equivalent noise model. 
So the problem with the motion coherence task is that there are actually many reasons why autistic and dyslexic children could have higher thresholds. So autistic and dyslexic children could show reduced sensitivity for different reasons. Um, and in particular, I'm focusing on some spatial parameters that might affect a performance. So first, it could be that autistic and dyslexic children may have reduced sampling. So by this, it means that they are combining of or pooling over fewer dots than typically developing individuals in line with the weak central coherence account. But it's also possible that autistic and dyslexic children are poorer at working out the direction of each individual dot direction. Um, and if those individual dot directions are being pulled together, this will also lead to um, uh, poor performance, reduced sensitivity. And finally, in this task, it could be a good idea to filter out the randomly moving noise dots and just focus on those signal dots that are moving in the same way. And this could again be limited in autistic and dyslexic children. And this has previously been proposed, um, particularly for dyslexia. So if we want to distinguish between these options, we're going to need another task. water before I go into the task because it's complex. Um, okay, so the other task um, we can use is a direction integration task, where rather than having separate sets of um, noise dots and signal dots, which I've highlighted in red here, um, you have uh, the dots taken from a single Gaussian distribution on each trial. And so we make it harder by just increasing the standard deviation of the dot directions um, in, in this task. So children are still working out the overall motion direction, but in this task, the optimal strategy is to average everything. Um, there's no randomly moving noise dots that need to be filtered out. So if we use this second direction integration task, we can also apply equivalent noise modeling, which allows us to estimate a, ch a child's sampling of um, how, much, how much information they're averaging over, as well as their internal noise, so how well they can work out the direction of each individual dot. So this um, diagram explains the concept. So the idea is that variability in our performance is determined both by external noise, so noise in the stimulus, and also noise inherent in our nervous system, internal noise. And the idea is that we can manipulate the variability in the stimulus, the external noise, to get an estimate of our internal noise. And the way that we manipulate the um, stimulus noise in a, uh, uh, our direction integration task is we change the standard deviation of the distribution from which the dot directions are taken. So in black is the normal way that people would um, uh, use this paradigm. So you measure a direction discrimination threshold, so what's the smallest difference left or right of vertical that can be perceived, at a range of different levels of external noise. And the way that we manipulate external noise here is that we're varying the standard deviation of the dots in our stimulus. So here, the standard deviation of dots, dot directions is zero, so that means that all of the dots are moving in the same direction. And by the time we get up here, the dots are more variable, so you have a, a, a wider, standard um, wider standard deviation, so there's higher external noise. And we can get an idea of the um, level of an observer's internal noise by seeing at what point those thresholds start to increase. So at low levels of internal noise, um, sorry, low levels of external noise, the internal noise is dominating, so the thresholds don't increase much. But at some point, the internal noise in the system is swamped, and then your thresholds start to increase with increasing external noise. So you can estimate the level of internal noise by the point at which this um, sort of function starts to increase, to, to rise. And the whole function will be shifted upwards if um, participants are averaging over fewer dots, so if they show um, reduced sampling. 
So from this function, we can get both an estimate of internal noise and also sampling. So the problem with um, this way of getting uh, an uh, equivalent noise function is it takes many, many trials, which is really tricky to do with children. So what we're doing here is we took a more efficient version of the equivalent noise uh, method. Um, so this is looking at the gray line here, where we just take two points on that equivalent noise function. So you have two conditions. You have a no noise condition where the standard deviation of dot directions is zero. So all of the dots are moving in the same direction. And then you're just trying to see what's the finest direction discrimination that is possible from left or right of vertical. Um, of vertical. And then you have a high noise condition where you fix the mean direction at plus or minus 45 degrees, um, and left or right of vertical, and then you see how much can we increase the standard deviation, so increase the external noise, until accurate discrimination breaks down. And those, those two conditions then constrain the fit of the equivalent noise function so that we can get our estimates of internal noise, so the precision with which we're estimating each individual dot direction, and also sampling, so how many dots are being averaged over. And we know from um, typically developing children that sampling increases with age and internal noise reduces, um, but it is particularly developments in sampling that drive age-related changes in um, motion coherence thresholds. So here we want to see well, where the differences might lie in autistic and dyslexic children. So I'm just going to show you the tasks um, quickly to see what they look like. So this is an example of a couple of stimuli from the direction integration task. Uh, they are quite quick because they were only shown on the screen for 400 milliseconds. Um, the kids were asked to say whether the shoal of fish are going to the green or the red reef um, to find their food, and their task was to beat scuba sound. Um, I have to make it fun. It's very boring otherwise. The first trial is from the no noise condition. And then the second trial is from the high noise condition. Okay, so no noise and then high noise. So the high noise one is really tricky. The mean direction is, fi uh, is fixed at plus or minus 45 degrees, but it's difficult because the standard deviation of dot directions is so um, large. And the exact stimulus intensities were chosen using an adapted staircase method um, called Quest to find the thresholds. We then also presented a standard motion coherence task at the same time for comparison. So here's a couple of examples of stimuli, um, one with high coherence and one with low coherence. Um, and this task was presented as a shark attack game, so children had to say whether the shoal were hiding from the shark in the red or the green rocks, and they were playing against the shark. So, we ended up doing two studies with these motion tasks in autistic children. And this was because we were so surprised uh, with the results that we got the first time round. So the original study presented direction integration and motion coherence tasks to 33 cognitively able autistic children and 33 typically developing children aged 6 to 13 years. And the children were matched in age and non-verbal eligibility. We then did a replication and extension study where we presented the same motion tasks, um, but also presented static orientation tasks um, to 46 autistic and 45 typically developing children. And the idea of presenting these um, orientation tasks was to see whether group differences were specific um, to motion processing or whether they might be more domain general. Um, so in the orientation tasks, rather than having moving dots, we had gamble patches and children had to work out which way they were tilted. So here I'm going to show you the results from our original study, where autistic children are shown as blue dots and typically developing children as purple dots. You can see immediately that there is a lot of variability um, between children, with the mean performance shown with a, a black point. Um, in the no noise condition, the absolute direction thresholds were similar between autistic and typically developing children with no significant group differences. Now, we were expecting autistic children to have difficulties integrating the motion signals in the high noise condition. 
But instead, we found that the autistic children were able to work out the average direction over a greater range of directional variability um, in the stimulus than typically developing children. So they actually showed enhanced integration ability. And we found no significant differences in our um, motion coherence thresholds in this study. When these thresholds were fitted with an equivalent noise function, we found that there were no significant group differences in internal noise. Um, but that the autistic children had uh, significantly increased sampling, suggesting that they are able to effectively average over more dots than typically developing children. Now, increased sampling should lead to in, uh, reduced motion coherence thresholds. So why is it that we don't see a benefit from this increased sampling in the motion coherence task? Well, we think that perhaps it's because in the motion coherence task, it's not just about averaging everything, it's also about filtering out those randomly moving noise dots. And perhaps it's that segregation of signal from noise that is limiting the autistic children in that task. So I've now added on the data for our um, replication study for the motion tasks. Now, the effect of um, uh, increased averaging ability is, is smaller in this uh, replication study, but if we take all the, result, uh, uh, the results together, combined across samples, then it shows strong evidence for um, increased maximum tolerable noise. So the meta-analytic meta phase factor is 20, so this suggests that there's 20 times more evidence in support of group differences than um, the null hypothesis and then had a phase factor of seven for the increased sampling. Again, the motion coherence thresholds, no, no noise thresholds and internal noise um, showed no evidence of group differences. Now we're gonna look at the um, results from the orientation tasks. And here we found no evidence for group differences in any parameters. Um, interestingly, if, if anything, the um, uh, maximum tolerable noise was slightly lower in the autistic children here than in the typically developing children. So this suggests that the increased integration does not extend to orientation processing in autistic children. We, we later then applied this same paradigm to children with dyslexia as part of a registered report. We saw 48 dyslexic children and 48 typically developing children aged 8 to 14 years and we gave them both motion and orientation tasks. Um, just to note on how um, we define dyslexia, the um, participants had a dyslexia diagnosis as well as spelling and reading composite scores um, that were under 89. So this, these are the results for the motion task with the ch children with um, dyslexia in blue and the typically developing children in gray. And again, lots of variability but we found two significant group differences. The first was higher um, internal noise, so that's here, in the children with dyslexia compared to the typically developing children. And we also found um, higher motion coherence thresholds in the children with dyslexia. So this is interesting as it's a different pattern than that we found in autism. So here, the ability to estimate individual drop directions is affected, but not the sort of more global ability to integrate over um, dots. And then looking at the um, orientation tasks, here the only significant difference was that orientation coherence thresholds were higher in children with dyslexia. Um, so if we compare that to the autism data, there we found no evidence of orientation processing differences. So it's a little um, recap. In the motion tasks, autistic children showed increased sampling compared to typical children, but no significant differences in internal noise, whereas the dyslexic children showed increased internal noise compared to typical children, but no differences in sampling. Meanwhile, in the orientation tasks, the autistic children showed no evidence of differences, but children with dyslexia had elevated orientation coherence thresholds. So, the equivalent noise approach has helped to uncover differences between these two developmental conditions. Okay. So now let's go on to the um, uh, temporal dynamics. 
So there are actually multiple and dynamic processes that are involved in making a decision about which direction stimulus is moving in. So if you were in the symposium beforehand, Guy was talking about this in her, her talk. So in our emotion coherence task, what do we need to do? Well, first, we need to do some basic sensory encoding. We need to perceive those white dots against the black background. And then we need to accumulate evidence about which direction these dots are moving in. We can't do it um, straight away. We've got to sort of combine information over time until we have enough evidence that we are ready to make a decision. And then once we've made that decision, we can go ahead and make a response. And work from monkeys shows that neurons in MTV5 process the motion signals, so the momentary evidence, but it's neurons in parietal areas that seem to show an accumulation to bound. So, so this is basically a kind of build-up of activity um, before the decision is made. So we wanted to know um, which stages of processing are affected in autistic and dyslexic children. So to address this, we use two methods which are sensitive to the multiple dynamic processes that contribute to responses, diffusion modeling and EEG. EEG is temporally sensitive, and you can look at um, activity linked to both early stimulus processing, so shortly after you've put something on the screen, as well as activity locked to responses. But let's start um, just talking about the diffusion model. So whereas our equivalent noise model just focused on the accuracy of responses, the diffusion model jointly models both accuracy and response time distributions to pr break down performance into distinct processing stages. And the idea is that when presented with sensory information and required to make a decision between two choices, the observer accumulates noisy sensory information um, until, uh, over time until they reach one of two decision bounds. So um, in, in a motion task, mm. these decision bounds could be um, left or right if you're deciding which direction the motion is going in. And there are three main parameters in this framework. So the first is drift rates. So this is the rate at which that noisy sensory information is accumulated towards the uh, uh, decision bound. So this can vary as a function of the stimulus. So if you have a stimulus with a stronger evidence strength, so um, for example, a stimulus with a higher motion coherence, then this drift rate will be um, higher. You'll have a steeper accumulation of evidence. But it's also a measure of sensitivity. So this, it also varies between observers. So someone who's more sensitive to a stimulus will have a higher drift rate. We then have boundary separation, which is how far apart those two decision bounds are. So if those bounds are narrow, then a person doesn't really need much evidence before they're happy to make a decision. So they're people who are more likely to emphasize speed over accuracy. Um, so they will be likely to make more errors, but they'll be going quicker. If you have those boundaries further apart, people are being a little bit more cautious. So they want to get more information before they're happy to make a decision. They're therefore likely to make fewer errors, but they'll be slower. And then, so far I've been talking about the decision-making process, which is um, shown at the top of this figure here. But outside of that decision-making process, we also have non-decision um, processes, including um, uh, sensory encoding, and also um, uh, response generation. And those um, two are combined into a single estimate of non-decision time in this uh, model. So what, why, why would we use this um, model? Well, the first uh, good reason is that it's been shown that group differences in these model parameters are actually more sensitive um, to group differences than looking at either the response time or the accuracy alone. And also, um, it's been shown that the model parameters relate well to neural measures, so we can link different levels of explanation. And in our typically developing children, we found that drift rate increases with age, while boundary separation and non-decision time reduce. So what did we expect might happen for our autistic children? Well, our pre-registered hypotheses were that we expected reduced drift rates in the motion coherence task, 
And this was following previous uh, reports of reduced sensitivity um, to motion coherence in autism. But conversely, we expected autistic children to have increased drift rates in our direction integration task following our previous um, study that suggested improved averaging ability in this task. We predicted that autistic children would show wider response boundaries, so that they would basically be making more cautious responses than typical children, um, and this was following the results of previous studies. Oops. And we predicted longer non-decision times than typical children, again following previous work. And then we also wanted to do some more exploratory analyses to look at the relationship between these par parameters and EEG. Okay, so to test these hypotheses, we saw 50 autistic and 50 typically developing children aged between 6 and 14 years, and we asked them to complete both motion coherence and direction integration tasks, as before. We then did hierarchical Bayesian diffusion modelling on the accuracy and response time data to estimate our um, parameters. The hierarchical part means that there were both individual participant level parameters and also group um, level parameters. And this is because we didn't have all that many trials that would typically be used for diffusion modelling. Um, so hierarchical models mean that you can get away with um, fewer trials, essentially, because you're um, shrinking your, um, each participant's estimates towards the group mean. And um, actually, I say we did the modelling. Uh, Nathan did the modelling. Um, and he was actually a blind modeller. So that meant that I gave him a blinded data set where I mixed up all of the group membership and he then designed the models based on that data so that he wasn't going to be biased by the group membership and our hypotheses that we were testing. We also collected EEG data using 128 channel EGI nets um, and then we used those in a series of joint models to look at relationships between the diffusion model parameters and EEG. And um, we extracted EEG components using a data-driven data decomposition technique called reliable components analysis. Okay, so just to look at the task. So again, we're presenting um, motion coherence and direction integration tasks. But this time, children were asked to respond as quickly and accurately as possible. And the story was that they were helping um, the zookeeper work out which way the fireflies were escaping out of the boxes. We made a few further changes to the tasks so, um, so that we could kind of optimise our EEG data collection. So um, after our fixation period, we had this pe period of random incoherent motion. And the reason for this was to get any kind of big evoked responses to motion onset mm -hmm. out of the way so that we could then focus on um, sort of direction-specific responses to directional motion in the stimulus um, phase. So the directional motion was um, presented until the child made a response, or up to two and a half seconds, and then there was just a short offset period um, where we continued the directional motion for a little bit. So unlike in our equivalent noise um, study, the stimulus phase um, just had two difficulty conditions for each task, and this was uh, necessary for our diffusion modelling. So here I'm showing you the accuracy and median response times for the difficult and easy conditions of the motion coherence task at the top and then the direction integration task um, underneath for typically developing children in grey and autistic children in orange. And these violin plots show the distribution of individuals' performance um, and the black points show the uh, mean performance. So you can see that the performance is really very similar between those two groups in both tasks. But again, there's this huge amount of overlap between the groups, lots of variability. This um, similarity was uh, quite a surprise, as we would e expected reduced accuracy and increased response time in our motion coherence task, and then the opposite pattern in our direction integration task, and for which we previously found enhanced performance. But our hypotheses weren't about accuracy or response time alone, so maybe our diffusion model parameters will allow us to more sensitively assess these differences between participants. Maybe. Um, so here I'm showing you the prior distribution in light blue, and then the posterior distribution in um, purple. 
if that purple posterior is shifted towards the right, that means that the autistic children have higher values of that parameter than the non-autistic children. So the fact that those blue and purple um, distributions are so closely sort of laid on top of each other reflects the fact that we really didn't find any conclusive evidence for group differences in parameters. The boundary separation was slightly higher in the autistic children. This was in line with our hypotheses. But you can see that the Bayes factor is um, really close to one. So basically, that suggests equivocal evidence. Um, there's no conclusive evidence for any group differences. There's near equivocal evidence for the alternative and the null hypothesis. OK, let's look at the EEG. So in our EEG, um, the most reliable component was um, <coughs> one that had maximal activity over centroparietal electrodes, the head. And this component had a gradual ramping up of activity <coughs> up to the point of response, which is shown at 0 milliseconds here. And in our previous work, we've shown that in typically developing children, this build-up of activity in this component relates to the drift rate in our diffusion model. So you've got, it reflects a sort of accumulation of evidence towards a decision bound. So we fit a slope to this um, each participant's component waveform to see how steep this buildup of activity was. And we found there was no differences between the groups in how steep that sort of buildup of activity was. And surprisingly, there was no clear relationship between the drift rates and the EEG slope in our autistic group. Um, and this is uh, in contrast to what we found previously in typical development. OK, what about the dyslexia study then? Um, so no clear differences between autistic and non-autistic participants. What did we expect with the children with dyslexia? Well, we hypothesised that they would have lower drift rates in the motion coherence task um, following previous work. We were less sure what to expect in the direction integration task, but we thought that they may have a lower drift rate in that task if they, um, children with dyslexia have general difficulties with processing motion information. Conversely, if the children with dyslexia have particular difficulties with that segregating signal from noise, they might not show any differences in drift rate in this, this second task. We also um, predicted that dyslexic children would have a wider boundary separation than typical children, so that they'd again be making more cautious responses, and we predicted no differences in non-decision time. Um, we used exactly the same tasks and the same models as in the autism study, but this time, um, because the dyslexic children were slightly older, we also partialed out age in this group. Okay, so you can, just, you can see um, from the accuracy and response time that the children with dyslexia are slightly slower overall, um, and they're also a little bit less accurate, particularly in the direction integration task. But there's a wide range uh, of scores with a huge amount of overlap between the groups. So looking at the diffusion modelling results, um, here our prior is in light green and then our posterior is um, in purple. So remember that if that purple is shifted to the left, that means that the dyslexic group had lower values of that parameter than the typical group. And the shifts are broadly in line with our, our hypotheses. So the drift rate in the dyslexic group is slightly lower than the typical group, um, the boundary separation is slightly higher, and there's no real differences in the normal decision time. But the only um, uh, comparison that we had um, sort of conclusive evidence for, so base factor over three, was um, the, this difference in drift rates. And for the other parameters, the evidence was very close to one, um, so inconclusive evidence. So what we can say um, from these results is that in line with our hypotheses, the children with dyslexia had reduced drift rates compared to typical children, and this was the case across both motion tasks. So it, it's, it's even found when you have a task that doesn't require that segregating of signal from noise. And then looking at the EEG, um, we found that the build-up of activity in this um, centroparietal component was shallower in um, the children with dyslexia. Um, compared to typical children, and that this EEG sort of slope was linked to drift rate in the children with dyslexia. 
also, it seems that the reduced drift rates shown by children with dyslexia go hand in hand with reduced build-up of activity in this centroparietal component. Okay, um, while I've shown you um, the EEG activity that's locked to responses, it's also possible to look at EEG activity that's locked to the stimulus onset to look at kind of early sensory responses to motion and see how those differ between autistic and dyslexic children. So this analysis was led by Lisa Toffoli. It's using the same data set as what I just showed you, um, but this time we were interested in an EEG component which had maximal activity over occipital electrodes at the back of the head. And what we found was that there were no group differences in early time points, reflecting kind of early um, uh, stimulus encoding, um, particularly at this N2 negative peak, where we we're expecting to see group differences because that's that peak has previously been linked to motion processing. So there were no differences in early time points, but we found some group differences at later time points, around 430 milliseconds after the stimulus had been presented. And this was specifically in the direction, in, um, sorry, in the motion coherence task, but not in the, the direction integration task. And it was for both autistic and dyslexic children who showed increased amplitudes at those later time points. So we have thought perhaps um, this dif difference specifically for the motion coherence task may reflect difficulties segregating signal from noise in both autistic and dyslexic children. So, summarising all of the studies, I hope I've shown how equivalent noise approaches, diffusion modelling and EEG can provide insights into the spatial and temporal parameters that affect visual processing in autistic and dyslexic children. Despite the fact that motion coherence thresholds have been reported to be elevated in both conditions, these paradigms actually suggest some syndrome specificity. In the autistic children, we have reported an increased ability to average motion information, um, and then no evidence of differences in orientation tasks, and no evidence of differences in our diffusion model parameters. Meanwhile, in our dyslexic children, um, we have found increased internal noise for motion processing, as well as elevated motion and orientation coherence thresholds. In the diffusion model par um, uh, paradigm, we found reduced accumulation of evidence, um, so this suggests that there's generally reduced sensitivity to motion information in both tasks, regardless of requirements to segregate signal from noise. And this reduced drift rate was um, linked to a shallower build-up of activity in a centroparietal EEG component. It's also maybe worth kind of pointing out that the children with dyslexia showed generally greater difficulties in these tasks than the um, autistic children. Bearing in mind that, for example, in that second paradigm, we found really no differences between the autistic and non-autistic um, children. And there are also, as one of those differences that I've mentioned, there are also points of convergence. So, for example, in that stimulus-locked EEG activity, um, there were sort of similarities between autistic and dyslexic participants who showed no differences in their early um, stimulus processing, um, but showed this perhaps reduced segregation of signal from noise. So that could be maybe common to both conditions. Okay, so some um, open questions and um, next steps. So I have said it a lot. Um, there is a theme throughout all of the data is that the group differences are subtle and there's lots of variability within each group. So it's really important to try and work out what factors might contribute to those individual differences. Relatedly, this work um, suggest some dissociations between autistic and dyslexic perception. Kind of following up from our symposium dis discussions, it's important to bear in mind that there are no clear-cut distinctions between different developmental conditions, and many children have more than one developmental condition. So it might be useful to think across diagnostic boundaries by assessing continuous dimensions and then, then look at how those might affect the spatial and, and temporal parameters that we've investigated here. There are also some um, unresolved issues, like um, why was it that we found group differences in our equivalent noise um, tasks, the autistic children, but not in our diffusion model um, studies? My guess is that it could be something about the stimulus intensities chosen, um, but that's definitely something that is needed, some more work to understand 
why we might sometimes have group difference and sometimes not. The results have implications for theories um, because they suggest that theories such as increased internal noise, um, weak central coherence, um, and dorsal stream vulnerability are insufficient for explaining these patterns of data. So that the theories need to be refined. And as the next step, I'd really like to try and work out how we might be able to integrate those two modelling approaches and to capture the spatial and temporal dynamics at the same time. And finally, more work is needed to understand how domain-specific these reported group differences are. So, for example, is the reduced evidence accumulation in dyslexia found for other visual tasks and even maybe non-visual tasks as well? Or is it specific to visual motion? Okay, um, that is everything. Um, I'm hoping I've got time for questions. Um, thanks again to the UPS for this prize and also um, to uh, everyone involved in the, these projects. It's been a huge collaborative effort, um, so thanks to all the collaborators um, and also to the families um, who took part and gave their time so generously.